right. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, George, for the invitation to speak in this seminar series. Um, so as George said, it's going to be a, an overview talk uh, about recent uh, developments in mixed precision computing. The motivation uh, for the field is the growing support of a uh, wider and wider range of floating point arithmetics on modern hardware. In addition to the standard uh, double and single precision that is 64 and 32 bit arithmetics, we now have uh, 16 bit and even 8 bit uh, arithmetics. Um, and uh, the main quantity uh, to look for in all these uh, arithmetics is the unit Randolph, uh, which basically controls the relative accuracy with which we can represent numbers in uh, the representable range of the format. And that unit Randolph also controls the relative accuracy of the uh, elementary scalar uh, operations. Um, so this talk is mainly going to be focused on the lower precisions in the table, uh, especially the 32 and 16 bit precisions. Um, the reasons we are interested in lower precisions are uh, performance mainly. So in terms of storage and everything that depends of storage, like data movement, uh, communications, and so on. Uh, obviously, switching to a lower precision format uh, makes the computations uh, much lighter. Uh, but there's also a speed benefit, uh, thanks to the support of modern hardware. Uh, the lower precisions are typically faster. And in some cases, uh, the speed ups can be really huge. I'll come back to that uh, in a few slides. So computations are faster in lower precision, and there's also uh, energy or power benefit. So lower precisions also reduce the consumption. Uh, the main drawback uh, from all these performance benefits is, of course, that the errors are proportional to the unit Randolph, so lower precision on its own provides a correspondingly lower accuracy. Uh, of course, lower accuracy is not uh, satisfactory in, in general purpose computations, so this is what motivates the use of mixed uh, as opposed to low precision algorithms. So the idea is we're going to use not just one, but several precisions in the same computation with the hope of achieving uh, the performance of the lower precisions, but uh, the accuracy of the higher ones. Uh, so I call this mixed precision. There's uh, quite a few other uh, names for this basic idea. I think it's basically the same idea, just different contexts or different communities. There is one specific uh, field that I wish to distinguish this talk from, which is precision tuning, uh, which is quite different. There, the idea is to automatically tune the precision given an input uh, source code. In a sense, these approaches are very general because they don't really need any uh, information or understanding of what the code does. That's also their main limitation. We can't really exploit uh, any specific uh, knowledge that we might have about our application. So I'm rather going to focus on the field of linear algebra where we can exploit uh, many, many insider knowledge of the computations to do very uh, well clever uses of mixed precision. Um, so we have a survey together with Nick Hyam that we published about a year ago that surveys these uh, algorithms in the field of, of linear algebra. Um, you have the table of contents on the right here. You can see the, the kind of algorithms that uh, we discuss. Uh, in this talk, I don't have the time to cover everything. Uh, I'm going to focus on linear systems mainly. Um, there's also some very cool and, and recent advances in the field of multi-word arithmetic in particular that I won't be discussing. Um, I think there was a talk about this uh, we, uh, in this seminar series just one or two sessions ago. Um, so yeah, feel free to, to have a look at the survey if you want to learn about this field. Um, so linear systems, that's what I'm going to focus mainly uh, in this talk. Uh, there's two broad classes of methods to solve linear systems. Uh, direct uh, solvers, which are uh, very robust, very reliable. Um, of course, they are associated with a, a high computational cost due to the need to uh, compute the factorization of the matrix. And iterative methods, which have a much lower uh, cost per iteration, but their convergence and therefore the total number of iterations is strongly uh, application dependent. So the way I, I like to summarize this is Direct methods to be effective need uh, fast factorizations and iterative methods need uh, good preconditioners. And the reason 
one of the reasons I chose linear system to illustrate uh, mixed precision computing is that in a way, uh, mixed precision or approximate factorizations bridge the gap between these two classes. We can use them both as approximate fast direct methods or as a high quality preconditioner for iterative methods. Um, so let me start at the direct end of the spectrum. Um, so the standard direct method to solve a linear system is uh, to use uh, to, to, to compute uh, null U factorization of the matrix and then directly solve the system by substitution. In finite precision arithmetic, if we do this in, with a unit round of uh, U for all computations, then the computed solution satisfies a backward error that is of order the unit round of. Uh, so it's a backward stable method. And the forward error as a result is uh, of order uh, the condition number of the matrix kappa A times the unit round of. Obviously, if we now use a low precision uh, with a direct method, the result will not be very good, especially if the matrix is somewhat ill-conditioned. Uh, we might have a, a result that uh, is completely incorrect. The sign even might not be the right one. Um, so this motivates the use of uh, refinement. Uh, so I'm going to start with the simplest and oldest version of refinement, which is uh, LU solver-based uh, refinement. So here the idea is we, we do the standard method of uh, solving uh, directly to get a, a first uh, solution x1. And then we have the refinement part, which uh, iteratively repeats three steps. We have a, a residual uh, that is computed by a matrix vector product. And then we solve another linear system, taking the residual as right-hand side. And this gives us a, a correction term here, d, that we then sum to the uh, current solution, and that's how we refine it progressively to higher accuracy. And the idea when using LU solvers is that both of these linear systems here, so the one, especially this one, the correction system here, is solved by substitution using the, uh, reusing the LU factors of the matrix. Uh, so this is a very old algorithm, a very old idea. It was first implemented uh, by Wilkinson in the late 40s uh, and analyzed by Muller a few decades later. And I think it's one of the oldest examples of mixed precision algorithms because in their uh, implementation, they were using uh, two precisions. So everything uh, was in the working target precision U, except for the residual computation, which was done in, in doubled uh, or extended precision. And the motivation for that is that by uh, performing the residual in higher precision, we can get rid of the of the kappa A term here in the fourth term. So we, now can get a somewhat correct result even using lower precision uh, because we don't have this uh, condition uh, dependence. Um, so that's one of the oldest examples, but the, probably the, the version that has uh, been more popular for LUIR uses a different combination of precisions uh, that was proposed in uh, the second half of the 2000s by a group of different authors. And here, the idea is rather to use a lower precision than our target U. So I'm going to call that UF and use this lower precision uh, for the LU factorization. Uh, so in particular, in the late 2000s, the motivation was to use single precision arithmetic, which was twice faster, at least than double precision. Uh, and so uh, this is computationally very attractive because now the n cube part of the work is done entirely in uh, single precision, and we just have n square flops per iteration in uh, double precision. And what's even more attractive is that we can actually still converge to double precision accuracy, to the higher uh, precision accuracy here. The only catch or limitation is that uh, we have a condition here uh, to guarantee this convergence that is uh, that depends on the lower precision. But if the matrix is not too ill-conditioned, uh, then this algorithm will work uh, very well. Um, so just to give a few, a few examples from, from that period, uh, I, I like to talk about the, the cell processor, which, which was quite famous for being uh, developed for the, for the PlayStation 3 at the time. Uh, and I like to talk about this processor because it's, I think, a striking example where the lower precision was uh, much faster than the higher precision. So in this case, single precision was about an order of magnitude faster than double precision. And so um, in this graph here, which is extracted from one of the of the references I mentioned, 
Uh, we see that the solution of linear systems can can be uh, done to double precision accuracy with huge speedups. I think it's a speed of uh, about a factor of eight that they achieve. Uh, and I like this example because I think we are basically reproducing history uh, today with the NVIDIA GPUs. Um, I think basically cell processor was kind of an exception at the time, and now the, the exception is almost becoming the rule. Uh, because most of the power of lower precisions come from these uh, GPU units. And here in the table, I'm, I'm giving well some numbers. Um, if we just focus on the on the last column, which is the most recent version of, of these NVIDIA GPUs, you can see that using 16-bit arithmetic, uh, we can reach almost a petaflop of performance just using a single GPU card, which is 16 times faster than 32-bit arithmetic. So that's a huge speed up. Um, and the reason we are able to achieve such speedups is uh, due to something called tensor cores. The tensor cores are a special uh, units that are available on these on these GPUs that are specialized to carry out uh, fixed dimension matrix multiplication. So, for example, it could be four by four or something like that. Uh, and there are some constraints on this uh, multiplication. Well, first, it has to be matrix multiplication and uh, second, there are some precision constraints. Uh, so we can compute A times B plus C, but the A and B matrices have to be stored in 16-bit arithmetic. However, uh, the result and the accumulation of rounding errors that goes on in, in this uh, computation, they can be done in 32-bit uh, arithmetic. So as I've mentioned, one of the benefits of these units is the performance boost. They can be much faster than standard single precision arithmetic. The other benefit is that there's a significant accuracy boost with respect to standard 16-bit arithmetic. Um, and this is mainly due to this uh, accumulation of rounding errors that can happen in, in single precision. So if we look at the error bound for, for matrix multiplication, in, in standard arithmetic, uh, the error is uh, equal to n, the inner dimension, times the unit runoff, right? And with this tensor course, we have kind of a mixed bound where the the n dependency uh, is along the 32-bit uh, unit runoff, uh, and we don't have any dependence on n on the uh, half-precision unit runoff. Uh, and, and of course, this this can be quite quite a boost for large matrices. Uh, and we can benefit from uh, this boost, both in terms of performance and accuracy, for other computations than matrix multiplication by uh, reformulating standard linear algebra computations as matrix-based. Uh, uh, computations. So, for example, for LU factorization, we can use a block algorithm um, that uh, performs most of the computations here. This is the update operation as matrix matrix uh, product. And therefore, we can rely on tensor cores uh, just by adding a, a conversion to FP16 just before doing the, the multiplication. Uh, and so that's how uh, we can exploit tensor cores for LU factorization. Um, and so we, we benefit from the, the better accuracy, the better error bound from tensor cores for LU factorization as well. So we have the same bounds actually, and this is just an experimental graph showing um, yeah, the difference in accuracy between standard uh, FP16 arithmetic in black and um, the red is tensor cores. So it's significantly more accurate, one or two orders of magnitude better. Uh, and this accuracy boost uh, is something we can uh, now benefit from in the context of LU-based uh, iterative refinement. Uh, so this is a result extracted from a paper by uh, Adam Heider and his co-authors. Um, I think it was the first paper using tensor cores for iterative refinement. And what we see here is uh, the performance to reach double precision solution. Uh, and basically, I just want to show uh, in purple is the, the, the one using FP32 factorizations, just like in the late uh, the second half of the 2000. Now using 16-bit arithmetic is the dark blue here. Unfortunately, it doesn't uh, work quite as well because, well, the, the conversions is too slow. But using tensor cores in light blue kind of corrects back the, the conversions. So the accuracy boost is really, uh, is really critical here. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, it's not bad. I mean, it's 20 teraflops, but um, the peak on this particular hardware, I think, is around 100. So it's not as good as we might have hoped. Uh, and there's uh, actually an interesting reason for this that I want to mention. Uh, and the, the reason is that 
a new factorization, I'm sure uh, you all know, uh, for large dense matrices is a compute bound operation. But we stand for cores, uh, we have to keep in mind that flops are now between 8 to 16 times faster, whereas the data movement hasn't really changed because we keep the, the matrix in, in the highest precision, so 32 bit arithmetic. Uh, and therefore, um, we don't reach the, the theoretical peak of the hardware because LU factorization, when using tensor cores, becomes a memory bound operation. Uh, I think this is a really striking observation. I mean, if you think about the, the uh, LIMPAC benchmark, uh, it's basically doing LU factorization of large dense matrices. And it's supposed to be illustrative or representative of the theoretical peak of the computers, right? And here, just on one GPU card, uh, we are, we're memory bound. So that, that's really, um, yeah, that's really surprising. Um, so one thing that we, we tried is what if we, uh, since we are memory bound, let's try to reduce the data movement. So what if we store the matrix in FP16? We should get a speed up of about a factor of two, right? And indeed, that's what we observe. The issue is that we also lose a lot of accuracy. We actually lose all the accuracy boost of tensor cores by doing that. Um, and the reason is that by uh, using FP16 as the base uh, working precision, we are forced to keep rounding uh, in, in FP16 after each update, right, in the new factorization. So that's what uh, the problem is. And so a few years ago, we worked on a, on a way to get rid of this uh, annoying uh, problem. And there were uh, basically two, two ingredients to, to our idea. Uh, the first is to basically use a, a splitted representation of the matrix uh, along the LU factorization, where we basically convert the matrix on the fly. Uh, we start with the FP32 matrix and then uh, co progressively convert it to FP16 as we go. Of course, that on its own is not going to be uh, enough because we still have the FP32 matrix at the beginning. Uh, and so the standard algorithm um, for LU factorization is called uh, something called right looking, or uh, you can see it as an, an eager algorithm in the sense that the updates are performed uh, as soon as uh, they become available. We end up writing uh, quite a lot of times the, the, the matrix here to the right, which is in FP32. So the second ingredient uh, is to uh, switch this uh, right looking pattern to a left looking one which is basically a lazy algorithm in the sense that now we are going to delay performing the updates to the last possible moment. And uh, thanks to this, we will uh, just update a small part of the FP32 matrix here while uh, reading many times uh, the part to the left, which is in FP16. So basically now we are, uh, asymptotically speaking, uh, gaining a factor of two on the data movement. So that's what uh, we obtain experimentally. Uh, so basically, factor of two as, as expected asymptotically uh, while maintaining a much better uh, accuracy than standard FP16 arithmetic. And I should mention these results are for the V100 uh, cards, but the, we also run them on the more recent A100 GPUs. And in, in this context, it becomes even more critical because the algorithm is even more memory bound uh, and we can reach uh, around uh, yeah, 200 teraflops thanks to this observation. Um, so that's one of the challenges of, of using FP16 arithmetic, memory boundness. Uh, a few more comments on other challenges. Um, you might have seen uh, in the very first slide that FP16 arithmetic has a reduced range uh, that we have to, to work uh, with. Uh, so one problem uh, can be uh, the overflow or underflow of uh, values in the LU factors, because even if the original matrix fits in the range, the, the LU factors uh, may not because of the growth of the values. Uh, so we, yeah, uh, Hayam and, and co-authors have proposed a, a, few, a few techniques here to scale the matrix to minimize the chance of that happening. Uh, and that also uh, can be used not just for overflow and underflow, but um, to minimize the uh, chance of subnormal numbers appearing, which can also uh, you know, be harmful to the performance. Um, so obviously, uh, I've talked about LU factorization, um, but we can do the same thing for symmetric matrices with LDL transpose factorizations or uh, with Cholesky factorization for positive definite matrices. One issue in, in that setting is that the matrix when rounded to half precision might not uh, be positive definite anymore. In this case, uh, some shifting strategies have been proposed to 
again, uh, ensure that doesn't happen. Uh, but I think the main challenge of uh, working with FP16 is uh, not necessarily range, but accuracy. Um, so to see this, uh, we need to go back to the uh, LUIR algorithm and uh, talk about the general analysis. So um, Carson and Hayam have, uh, have done this, uh, I think it's the most general analysis to date, which is a three precision analysis. The motivation was that now that we have 16 bit arithmetic in hardware, uh, it makes sense right, to have three precision parameters. Um, and so the, the idea is that we can have the factorization uh, in the lowest precision, UF, so FP16. Uh, the target precision could be 32-bit uh, arithmetic, for example, and we could use a higher precision, uh, like 64-bit arithmetic for the residual. So this is basically combining the work of Wilkinson in the late 40s with the work of uh, Langu, Butari, and others in the uh, 2000s, right? So we're, we're basically getting both benefits of mixed precision here, uh, we're doing most of the computations in the lowest lowest precision, and we're using the highest precision to absorb the kappa A term here. And the final accuracy just depends on the middle precision. Uh, so this is very elegant, uh, I think, and it's worth mentioning, it's actually the most as general as it can be, right? Um, we cannot make this algorithm more general. Um, that might not be obvious because we actually have three steps here that use the same precision, um, but it doesn't, it's not meaningful to distinguish uh, these steps. Uh, the reason is that here we're solving the correction system by replacing A inverse by its, the inverse of its LU factors, right? Uh, so if we compute the LU factorization in a, in a low precision UF, then this uh, replacement here, this approximation is going to be anyway, um, it's going to be affected by this initial error UF. So what I mean by that is we could solve this substitution here in exact arithmetic, uh, and it would not change anything to the algorithm. Uh, so we might as well perform those two steps in precision UF. And in fact, um, this is the reason why we are um, limited to uh, condition numbers such that uh, that are smaller than the inverse of the of the lowest precision. Um, and so this is probably the most limiting factor of this algorithm now. If we're using 16-bit arithmetic, I mean, it can work very well and we can get very high performance, but the matrix has to be quite well conditioned, right? I mean, we have like three or four digits of accuracy, so we're talking about condition numbers limited to a thousand, right? Um, so to, to overcome this, this limitation, um, we can switch basically from a different type of, of uh, iterative refinement. So we're not going to look at LU-based iterative refinement anymore, but uh, at GMRS-based iterative refinement, where the main idea is just to change the way this correction system here is solved by replacing the LU solver by a GMRS solver, an iterative solver, that is preconditioned by the LU factors. Um, and so the, the rationale for this change is that um, unlike LU substitution, which is, like I said, mm -hmm. limited by the, the, the initial precision of the factorization, uh, GMRS can be asked to converge to an arbitrary accuracy. So we could ask it to converge to, a, to the target accuracy U. Um, and moreover, the, the precondition matrix uh, is likely to be better conditioned. Therefore, the, the convergence condition, so the, the applicability of this method uh, extends from this condition here this condition here, where uh, we have a much smaller unit Randolph and a potentially smaller uh, condition number. Um, so that uh, seems very promising. There is one catch, which is that for this analysis to, to, to work, we need to assume that the, the matrix vector products that happen in GMRS are performed in extra precision, so in precision U square here, uh, because otherwise they would uh, introduce extra rounding errors um, that can amount to a uh, factor of kappa A. Um, so that's quite a, quite a catch, and I will come back to it. But first, um, just some numbers to illustrate the, the how GMRS IR extends the, the range of condition numbers that we can handle. Um, so 
Uh, yeah, I'm taking two two examples here. Either we do the factorization in, in single precision. In this case, we were limited to uh, about 10 to the 8. Uh, with GMRS IR, we can double the range of, of well, uh, we can go to 10 to the 16, uh, which is much better. And for uh, FP16 factorization, the, the limitation was really strong, right? 10 to the 3. And now we can go back to something that is a lot more reasonable, thanks to GMRS IR. Um, so that's good. As I've mentioned, uh, performing the LU solves, the products in GMRS in precision U square is uh, quite a practical limitation, especially if we are targeting double precision. In this case, U is FP64 and U square is quadruple precision. So we should be applying the LU solves in quadruple precision according to the algorithm. Uh, that doesn't sound reasonable. Um, so uh, this motivated us to rethink um, the, the, this GMRS IR. And basically ask uh, the following questions. Um, I mean, we what we really want is to bound the, the relative accuracy with which we solve the, the correction system. So the, the questions we should be asking is, um, do we really need that much precision in GMRS? And how much extra precision do we need for the products? As you can see here in, in, in the version, in the original version, we had two parameters that were depending on the target uh, unit round of view. And uh, what we propose is to make them independent parameters, um, so, you know, general um, unit round of UG and UP. UG is for the GMRS, the basic GMRS, and UP is for the products with the uh, preconditioner, uh, which brings us to five precision parameters. Now we ask, uh, what, what can we say about the conversions of this more general algorithm? Um, to answer this question, we first need to, to analyze two precision GMRS, right? So the, just the, this particular version of GMRS that we use as solver for the correction system. Uh, and so um, this is based on uh, some uh, analysis of Page and co-authors that uh, prove that unpreconditioned GMRS in just one precision is uh, backward stable. So we have backward error of order UG, forward error of order uh, kappa A UG. So we can generalize this work to a two-precision preconditioned version where the second precision is used precisely for the products with the preconditioner. And as anticipated, we have this extra annoying kappa A term here, but it's proportional to the UP term. Um, and the UG term is unaffected by the kappa A term. Um, so that's, well, that's a, a more general bound. I think it's uh, quite an interesting result on its own. It's, a, it's an interesting side result. But our aim uh, is to now use this uh, two, pre two precision GMRS as correction solver for uh, iterative refinement. Uh, and so if we do that, um, we can obtain a, a, well, a very nice theorem that has five parameters in it. So we can see that we have two, two parts in the, in the theorem. We have the, the condition for conversions to happen which depends on the uh, precisions of the factorization and the GMRS correction solver. And if conversions happens, we know that the attainable accuracy will depend on the, on the highest precision, so the, the working precision and the residual precision. Um, so I mentioned before that uh, three precision LUIR was the most general possible version of LUIR. I think this is the most general possible version of GMRS IR. And it might not be obvious at first sight what we should conclude from this, right? There's lots of lots of parameters, uh, which is why we we try to um, well uh, distinguish some some combinations of precisions that can be interesting. So that's what we call meaningful combinations, uh, in the sense that uh, it's obvious that not all combinations are going to be relevant in practice, right? Uh, we have um, five or, or even more now is eight bit arithmetic. So we have a lot of different arithmetics. We have five different parameters. So we have thousands of possible combinations, but um, we shouldn't really overuse precision. So we should just look at meaningful combinations in the sense that um, if there's a precision that we can lower without losing anything, then we can should lower it. Right? So with this definition of meaningfulness, we can reduce the number of combinations to a relatively small subset. And here I'm showing the uh, subset of meaningful combinations that exploit half precision factorization and reach uh, double precision accuracy. As you can see, there is not that many. 
uh, and so at the two extreme of these tables, um, we have the the uh, okay the, the at the top of the table we have uh, LUIR which uh, was quite limited in terms of condition numbers, uh, and at the very bottom of the table we have the original uh, Carson and Hyams GMRS IR which uh, was very robust but was using quadruple precision for the for the LU solves. So in between, we have quite a few different variants that achieve different uh, compromises between how ill-conditioned the matrix uh, can be allowed to be and what precisions we actually use for the computations. Uh, so this allows us to, to choose well, a flexible uh, trade-off between the constraints coming from the problem and the constraints coming from the computer. So. I want to make a small digression here to talk about right preconditioning. Um, so far, I've been focusing, I, I haven't said so, but it was implicit that we were preconditioning on the left. Um, I think some of you might be wondering why not precondition on the right? That would be actually a very, a very sensible thing to do uh, using flexible GMRS, of course, to allow for the, um, the LU factors or the, whatever preconditioner you have to be applied in, in potentially a lower precision. Um, reason that choice has not been as uh, advertised in the literature is it's actually quite hard to prove anything about the stability of right preconditioning uh, solvers. Uh, we, th there's been some 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 attempts, uh, including a very recent one by um, by Carson uh, on flexible uh, on split precondition flexible GMRS. Uh, but we have, yeah, I mean, the bounds are not are not as good. Uh, there are some hidden parameters that um, are quite annoying. But in practice, uh, it actually does work quite well. So, yeah, from a practical point of view, I think right preconditioning certainly uh, certainly lo looks attractive because we can apply the preconditioner in, in low precision. Of course, there's the cost of using a flexible uh, GMS, but that's a trade-off. Um, all right, so... I've focused a lot on dense matrices so far. I want to say a few words about sparse matrices. Um, there's quite a few specific properties that sparse matrices have that influence how iterative refinement behaves. Um, and the main one is the fill-in property, uh, which basically means that uh, if we start with a very sparse matrix, uh, its LU factors, the factorized matrix, uh, are uh, is typically much denser. And that can actually be a good thing in the context of iterative refinement because it means that the original high precision copy of, of the matrix is actually negligible in terms of footprint. And as a result, uh, iterative refinement can actually be used to save memory, which is not the case for dense systems where the, the copy of the original matrix basically weights as much as the value factors, right? Um, so iterative refinement is very attractive for sparse systems in, for this very reason. Um, there's also some uh, some disadvantages um, uh, related to the weight of, of all the operations. I mentioned before that we did the, the NQ part of the work in low precision for dense matrices, but for sparse matrices, the, the complexities are a bit different. And uh, the N cube becomes N square and N square becomes N to the four thirds. And that's in the best case where we have a nice cube. Um, so there's, yeah, the, the ratio is different and there's less room to amortize the iterative phase. Um, so that that might be a problem. Um, and so on, on that topic, let me uh, show you a few uh, snapshots of a few results that we can get. So these results are obtained with the MOM solver, um, but um, I think all I mean, other sparse direct solvers would probably uh, behave similarly. Um, so we're comparing here uh, the time and memory costs, since we also save memory. Um, for three variants, so the standard 64-bit solution solver and the uh, solver based on a 32-bit factorization combined with iterative refinement, either based on LU or GMRS. Um, so at a, at a glance, we get basically a 2x speedup and uh, memory reduction for most problems, even some of them being quite ill-conditioned. Um, and LUIR is actually the fastest in and the in least expensive in most situations, but it does fail on some occasions because it can it depends on the conditioning, right? 
uh, whereas GMRS IR is more expensive, but it, it's guaranteed not to fail. So yeah, uh, it's a trade-off. <clears throat> um, all right, so um, LU factorization is very nice, uh, but it can be quite expensive, especially if the matrix is large and, and sparse. So um, obviously, can we use something cheaper? Can we replace the LU factors by some other more general preconditioner? Um, sure. Uh, so the algorithm looks like this. Uh, so this is for GMRS IR. Uh, it's basically the same, but I've replaced just the inverse of the LU by a, a general in, M inverse. And what I really want to emphasize here is that actually this algorithm that you're seeing is exactly the same as restarted GMRS. It is numerically equivalent to restarted GMRS. Uh, I'm not sure this is a well-known observation. It's not very hard but I, I haven't seen many people uh, making this observation. Um, I think it's interesting because iterative refinement can therefore be seen as bridging the gap between, you know, I mean, we started with a pure direct solver and now we're, uh, to, we're back to the restarted GM rest. Um, and it also gives some indication on how to choose the, the precisions here because we can use the, error, the quite vast literature on error analysis for iterative refinement for a restarted GM rest. And uh, in particular, if we remove the preconditioner, so we take M uh, to be identity, then we are back to something called uh, mixed precision inner outer scheme, which is a very old idea from the 90s, um, uh, which motivates, so we, we, we can basically, the error analysis of iterative refinement motivates this, this kind of scheme, which basically says that we can run a, a GMRS in low precision and then use that as inner solver and just have a, an outer loop that corrects and refines the solution. And that, that works very well in practice too, for problems which do not require preconditioning, of course. Um, and for the majority of other problems that do require preconditioning, uh, I am going to just give a, a few snapshots on, on a few possibilities. I'm going to focus on uh, sparse preconditioners. Um, so I've mentioned LU factors, uh, exact LU factors, full LU factors are can, can be quite uh, expensive because they become denser. So one idea is to sparsify them. Uh, so we can do something called dropping where we are going to replace um, values, coefficients that are sufficiently small based on some threshold epsilon by zero. So we could do this on the original matrix, have a sparse matrix, we uh, get a sparser matrix, but more commonly we uh, do this on the LU factors, which are quite dense and now we get uh, sparser factors, which are called incomplete LU factors. Um, so that's sparsification. And I uh, like to compare this to data sparsification, which uh, is basically using um, low rank approximations. So in, in this context, um, as you know, we, we can, if we have a singular value decomposition of uh, a matrix, we can truncate the singular vectors that are associated with uh, Single values smaller than a given threshold uh, epsilon. And uh, by doing that, we obtain an approximation to accuracy epsilon. So the, the idea in the context of linear system is not to do this on the, on the full matrix itself, which is typically not very low rank, but rather to partition the matrix into, uh, into blocks and then apply uh, low rank compression or data sparsification uh, to uh, many of its of diagonal blocks. Um, so we might even replace some blocks by zero, in which case uh, we, we get back to the dropping strategy, but more generally, we're going to replace uh, full dense blocks by uh, low rank factors. Um, and so you might end up with a matrix that looks like this, uh, like on the right. Um, so the interesting part is we can combine these sparsification, data specification, or block low rank approaches with iterative refinement. Um, from an analysis point of view, we can just see these, um, these approximations as just uh, some kind of low precision, right? So we can just replace uh, UF in the, in the analysis by just UF plus epsilon, where epsilon controls the accuracy of the approximations and uh, everything works. Uh, so here you have an, an example um, that I quite like where uh, we, okay, we have the 64-bit the reference here. 
so I've already shown before what we can do by switching to 32-bit, uh, speed up of about two and memory reduction of about two as well. Now let's add data specification, block the rank to this. If we use a threshold that is too small, we might actually not uh, gain anything because we don't compress uh, sufficiently. But at some point, the compression is going to start becoming uh, beneficial and we can get quite very uh, nice speed ups and reductions of the memory. And here uh, I'm showing the overall performance of the solver. So this includes the, the iterations to go back to, double, to full double precision accuracy. Right? Um, what's interesting is that we can continue uh, decreasing this threshold. And at some point, LUIR is going to run into you know, failure of convergence due to the conditioning, whereas GMRS IR will continue to converge. And that means that in terms of memory in general, uh, GMRS IR uh, will, will be able to, uh, to outperform LUIR. So if you are in a very memory critical context, that, uh, that is also one, one reason to, to rely on GMRS IR. Um, all right, and to conclude, uh, I have um, I want to mention some uh, some recent uh, emerging subclass of mixed precision algorithms that uh, we call adaptive precision, and which have been quite successful in the context of uh, sparsification. So, one thing that you can uh, notice about sparsification, both dropping and low rank approximation is that they, they really deal only in absolutes. Uh, we either keep the data at full accuracy or we just drop or discard the data completely. There's no middle ground. So adaptive precision uh, is a new paradigm that tries to use not just one you know, very uh, aggressive uh, dropping, but uh, multiple gradual levels of approximation where we're gradually going to switch the data to lower and lower precisions and end up dropping it at the very end. Uh, and this is motivated by the fact that uh, in, in real applications, we do have data that uh, are not all equally uh, sensitive or important. An example of this is when we are summing two numbers uh, and one of the numbers is much smaller than the other. Uh, what happens in this case is that the, the quite a good chunk of the least significant bits of the smallest number are actually not really important. Uh, they're not going to affect the result of the addition, so we might uh, discard those bits which means we might store this smaller number into lower precision. So this is the basic idea of adaptive precision. And I want to mention two contexts in which this uh, framework uh, gives quite interesting results. The first is to compute sparse matrix uh, vector products. So assume we want to compute such a product using a, a bunch of different precisions, um, um, Q, Q different precisions. One idea is to split the elements of the sparse matrix into buckets. We have as many buckets as we have precisions, uh, and each bucket is going to use a different precision. And the question is, you know, how should we build the bucket? Which element should we put in, in which bucket? And we end up with something that looks like, like this figure here, where uh, the very smallest elements, we're going to drop them, as I've mentioned before. The very largest one, we're not going to touch them. We're going to keep them in the in the highest precision. But in between, we're going to you know, switch them to lower and lower precisions. And we have an error analysis that uh, tells us that by doing this, we can you know we can control the loss of accuracy. So we have a threshold epsilon that controls uh, exactly what happens. Uh, and so these are some numbers to illustrate uh, the type of, of gains that we can have. Uh, so in blue, you have the, the storage as a percentage of the of the uniform standard FP64 product. Uh, and you can see that it's very matrix dependent, right? Because for some matrices, uh, you'll have a lot of variations in the magnitude of the entries. And for some, you won't. So for example, for some matrix, you, you don't have any, any benefits in doing this. For some, you have huge uh, reductions. And of course, SPMV is a uh, memory bound operation, so storage, uh, translates into time gains that are uh, similar. And finally, you can see that the back order is uh, safely controlled. Um, and I want to mention an ongoing, uh, very nice ongoing uh, work where uh, this approach uh, is actually, I mean, you don't need to use hardware precisions, right? We have a continuum of approximations. So in principle, you could use bit by bit approximation. So that might be a bit extreme. But um, we can use emulated formats that use uh, you know uh, like 24 or 40, 48, 60, 56 bits. Um, 
that uh, yeah, I mean that, that's one of the benefits of these uh, adaptive precision approaches. Um, and of course, this adaptive precision SPMV can also be used in the context of GMRS-based uh, iterative refinement, where uh, we have two SPMVs, right? We have one in the outer loop, the outer scheme, and one in the inner loop. So the idea there is to use different thresholds, a low precision for inner solver and a higher precision for the uh, outer solver. And that's the kind of, of results that we can get. Um, so on this curve, I'm showing the convergence for uh, an example of a matrix. You can see that uh, in blue, we have FP32, which manages to, to converge to double precision accuracy. In red, we have BFLOAT16, which does not converge. Uh, and in yellow, we have the adaptive precision, which is basically trying to mimic or try to stay equivalent to FP32. And indeed it does. Uh, and what's nice about this adaptive uh, framework is that we can do a continuum of different accuracies. We don't have to be constrained by the hardware. So we can use you know, several values of this threshold and find a, a good compromise in terms of cost and, and convergence. Okay, and quite quickly, the last uh, example uh, of adaptive precision algorithm I want to give is uh, for low rank approximations. So as I've mentioned, the, the standard approach is very uh, dual, right? It's either we keep the single vectors or we, or we discard them. Uh, this adaptive precision uh, does something a little more subtle where we are going to uh, switch the single vectors gradually to lower and lower precisions. Again, this is based on the same observation that we are summing uh, components, low rank components that become smaller and smaller in magnitude. And uh, we can use this adaptive low rank representation to compute a block low rank uh, LU factorization. We can benefit from this, uh, this kind of representation to reduce both memory and, and flops uh, while preserving uh, stability. Um, and so we've started implementing this in maps. And I just want to mention, I think this is an interesting uh, strategy that we've taken to uh, to do this. We basically dissociated uh, our objective. Uh, if we want storage gains, then again, because adaptive precision you know, is not constrained by hardware, we could vary the precision very finely. And we're doing this by using you know, the seven formats that I've mentioned before. We have a lot, lots of different columns, uh, lots of different formats, and we're just using them for storage. Uh, now, if we want to achieve time gains, of course, now we're, we're constrained by hardware and the availability of, of precisions. And so we have a different scheme, right? So we're dissociating the two schemes, um, storage and computations. And I'm just going to show results for the storage one, because we're still implementing the, the computations one. Um, and so we get, well, for, for a range of different matrices, reduction uh, in terms of memory that are quite significant. Uh, and again, while preserving and while controlling the, the error. Okay, so um, as a conclusion, uh, I just want to give a, basically a plausible scenario for what a, a linear system solver might look like today with the use of mixed precision. So this is actually um, combining everything I've presented today, and it's not just because it looks cool doing it, it's actually sensible to combine everything. Um, and I think there's three key ideas or takeaway messages that I, that I want to mention. The first is refinement, right? That's a basic framework. We're going to first compute an initial solution to low accuracy and then refine it to higher precision. Uh, that's an old idea. Now, the recent ideas are first modularity. We're going to relax and use independent precision for uh, or independent accuracy parameters for every operation that we do. And this will allow us to find a very flexible uh, compromise, a trade-off between uh, different metrics. And the final uh, ingredient is adaptivity. For each of these kernels, we can actually try to adapt to the actual data that is given as input to do the best job that we can. Um, all right, so uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. There's a question in the chat. Does CUDA programming interface provide functions for invoking computations on tensor cores using lower precisions? like int8, apart from libraries like kublas, because they can't be invoked from inside a custom device kernel. Okay. Well, we're, yeah, I mean, in all the results I've, I've shown, we were using kublas. Um, 
I'm not sure whether uh, tensor cores are usable in other libraries from from NVIDIA or yeah, I I don't have experience in that. Um, the philosophy in like for example the LU factorization is to you know develop our own code that uses Kublas as uh, the main kernel, but everything on top of Kublas is our own uh, code. And I think it's kind of unavoidable at the moment if we want to resort to the kind of fine uh, you know, optimizations uh, that I've shown, like optimizing data movement or making sure that we don't lose accuracy by doing the wrong kind of thing. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the impressive talk. Um, I got a question uh, very early in the talk on slide 16. Uh, you said that using this tensor course and FP16, um, LU factorization becomes memory bound in some sense. Um, could you elaborate? Is that an absolute statement or what does it depend on? Because it seems very unintuitive, right? Because you need n cubed computations, but only have n squared data, let's say. So could you specify this? Yeah, of course, from a theoretical point of view, if you take asymptotic sizes, if you take n that goes to infinity, you will still be compute bound, of course. Um, but in practice, for fixed size, and especially a size that fits into a single uh, GPU card, uh, we're memory bound, right? We, we don't reach the, the theoretical throughput of the, of the card. You can see this here. Where we, we were, well, even with our optimizations, we reach like 50, right, at most, uh, but the peak is 100 and something. Okay, uh, thank you. So your, your statement uh, applies whenever you consider the maximum memory of current hardware. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you very much. I have a question very early, slide three, where you state uh, the power consumption properties of different uh, precisions. So uh, FP16, 11 bits, consumes five times less energy than FP32. Where do, where do these numbers come from? Do they come from some theoretical analysis? Of the, uh, uh, yeah, I have a reference that I didn't include here. Um, I, I don't know why, but according to that reference, um, the power consumption of floating point arithmetic depends on the square of the number of mantis bits. Uh, if there's anyone in the public that can confirm these or explain why that is the case. That would be interesting. Um, but that's that's the, yeah. So I have one more. Um, if you talk about adaptive precision, have you looked into um, modern number formats that are not fixed in terms of matrices and exponents like unums or posits? Um, yeah, I know there are hardware implementations of those, but um, I mean, you could play around. Yeah, that would definitely be interesting. Yeah, uh, that's one of the things I I like a lot about this adaptive framework. We we were free from hardware constraints or efficiency constraints or any any kind of constraints. Uh, so yeah, that that would that would definitely be interesting. I think uh, I, I don't have experience playing around with unums, but I, I think for example FPGA uh, that's one of the things we want to look at in the future. I mean, it's still based on floating point arithmetic, but um, the fact that the possibility of varying the, the precision at a very, very fine level certainly makes a lot of sense in this in this context. First, uh, Theo, th thanks very much. Great, great talk. Hi, um, How far, in your opinion, are you we away from talking uh, fixed precision, just uh, integers? Right. If, if, if I have seven different uh, floating point precisions, Aren't we already close to really thinking of integer computations? Yeah, I guess in some way we're already doing that. I mean, some of the uh, GPUs are already doing that, right? But um, with integer, uh, like int8 tensor cores. I haven't seen much attempts to do that for like general purpose, like for, for solving a linear system. Um, I think it should be doable if you just pay attention to the scaling, right? It's uh, it's always the same thing. If you if you're willing to, you know, to do the work of you know, scaling, and basically re-implementing a floating point arithmetic by hand, uh, but using underlying fixed point arithmetic, uh, yeah, I mean, why not? But I don't have There's any any experience. Yeah. Interesting compromise that uh, comes from 
Needles, who is unfortunately not here in the audience because he's on vacation, uh, they have been playing around with what they call a block floating point format. So basically, you have one exponent and then a whole vector of, of only mantissas. Is, is that something that is, is being considered out in, in a wider community? Yes, yes, that, that actually is something we are doing in, in this very slide here, um, because okay. in, in the adaptive precision context, um, because we're grouping the data or the coefficients or whatever by by magnitude, right? So mm -hmm. I talked about buckets before, right? So okay. in a given bucket, uh, all the data is more or less of the same magnitude. Uh, so it makes sense to, to mutualize the exponent, right? Okay, great. Um, yeah, a bit outside of the talk. Um, what is your uh, what is your take on mixed precision ideas outside of linear algebra applications? Do you think uh, there's a big chance to apply them successfully to, I don't know, let's say FFTs or stencil codes and so on? I don't know nearly enough about either of those two applications to to give a relevant answer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, it, a bit more general because uh, if you look up the literature, you find mostly linear algebra. So you 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 think it's still work that has to be done, but there are. Do you have any opinion on how high the chances are to do it successfully? I think the chances are very high, just based on my own experience of looking almost randomly at different types of computations and systematically finding out that there is opportunity to switch precisions. Actually, I think we should stop thinking in terms of static precisions, right? We shouldn't st we should really start asking the question, what is the precision that I actually need? And that should be like the default uh, way of thinking when computing. Um, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the interesting talk. So uh, I have a question in the binning method for SPMV. Um, isn't the precision also depends on so on the not just on the a matrix but also on the vector x right so there should be some limit from that right? yeah that, that that's a good question it depends on how you measure accuracy um on this slide i've conveniently uh, measured the accuracy in a normwise sense as you can see in which case the answer is no it does not depend on the vector which is quite mm -hmm. convenient in an iterative uh, setting where the vector changes but the matrix is fixed uh, if you want to measure the accuracy in a component-wise sense, uh, where you, you basically replace the norms here by absolute values and take the you know the max over all the the elements, uh, then yes, it does depend on x, uh, which makes this slightly more tricky. Um, but yeah, we, in the paper that is referenced here, we we discuss this issue and, and show a few a few solutions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 